The moment the world learned that Prince Harry, who is fifth in line to the British throne, and Meghan Markle, one of the stars of Suits, were dating, the actress was met with a slew of support and also criticism. After the pair announced their engagement in November 2017, Markle immediately faced more hate and negativity than ever before. Here are some famous folks who simply can't stand her. Wendy Williams Talk show host Wendy Williams is clearly not a fan of Meghan Markle. In December 2017, the brash, outspoken host told her audience that she thinks Markle is a bit of a wild card, you know, because she goes from being the deal or no deal girl, so this is a girl looking for game. A few months later, in February 2018, the topic of Markle came up again while Williams was interviewing 90210 star Anna Lynn McCord. After asking the actress about Markle's small cameo on the 90210 reboot, she couldn't resist throwing more shade. She applied for a job here, too, so Does we she? feel like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> there you go. See? Random princess. It seems that Williams' dislike runs deep. Back in November 2016, when it was first revealed that Markle was dating Prince Harry, the host predicted a breakup, saying, There's way too much drama with her, and this will not work out. It's not her. It's going to be the family. The family's going to mess it up. Williams doesn't just focus her royal jealousy on Markle, however. By the way, Kate, what is going on with your fried ends? She looks like she has about 20 packs of weave in her head, doesn't she? Stay classy. Piers Morgan British TV personality Piers Morgan is known for making headlines, and he did just that when he accused Markle of ghosting him. According to his side of the story, which he shared during a February 2018 episode of ITV's Loose Women, he was actually friends with Markle before she ever met her royal beau. The two met via Twitter and admitted they were fans of each other. Some email exchanges apparently followed, and the pair eventually met at Wimbledon. Morgan says the two of them had a drink and were, quote, great buddies for about 90 minutes. Unfortunately, the friendship was short-lived. Next thing I know, silence. Nothing. Off the radar. Well Fast forward to March 2018 and Morgan was talking about Markle yet again, this time on Good Morning Britain, as he criticized the couple's choice to have an organic lemon and elderflower cake on their big day instead of following royal tradition with a fruitcake, saying, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle are creating scandal and sensation by going their own way. To me, when you get married, you don't muck around. You stick to tradition and have a fruitcake. Katie Hopkins no one has been quite as scathing in their commentary of Meghan Markle as British media personality Katie Hopkins. In November 2016, the reality TV star turned Mail Online reporter penned an entire article in which she unapologetically went after the young actress, calling Prince Harry's then-girlfriend, shy and retiring, Instagram-addicted Meghan. Dubbing her an American Kate Middleton, she quipped, Given she used to work as a freelance calligrapher, which basically means she can write with a pen, her fortunes have taken off faster than British astronauts Tim Peake on his way to the International Space Station. She then went on to rip apart the prince's official request for the media to respect Markle's privacy, writing, If you don't want Miss Sparkle trolled on social media, advise her to stay away from posting pictures of bananas spooning on her Instagram account. If Megan, a woman who acts and does PR for a living, doesn't understand that, then dare I suggest maybe she isn't suitable girlfriend material, let alone a potential bride. The cattiness sure hasn't cooled off over the years, as in February 2018, Hopkins took to Twitter to call her a budget princess die with an Oscar-winning innocent face. Chrissy Swan she may not be a household name in North America, but Australian TV personality and author Chrissy Swan has been one of Markle's harshest critics. Taking to Facebook to express her disapproval of the bride-to-be, Swan confessed, For some reason, I still haven't warmed to her. It's her manner. She looks like she's performing. To me, she looks like she's portraying a concocted humility. Acting. Her ex-husband a book from royal biographer Andrew Morton, who penned Princess Diana's biography in 1992, is making waves with allegations that Meghan Markle was ruthless when it came to ending her first marriage to Hollywood producer Trevor Engelson. In Meghan, a Hollywood princess, Morton writes that, Trevor went from cherishing Meghan to, as one friend observed, feeling like he was a piece of something stuck to the bottom of her shoe. It was in 2013 and the couple had been married for two years when, all of a sudden, Markle, who was living in Toronto at the time filming Suits, sent her wedding and engagement rings back to Trevor by registered post, allegedly out of the blue. According to the author, Engelson can, quote, barely contain his anger, even after all these years. Kendall and Kylie Jenner have their followers, but they've also got a whole lot of haters. Perhaps it's simply par for the course because they're rich, beautiful, and famous. However, some of the vitriol directed at these satellite Kardashians is the fault of their own pettiness and penchant for drama. Here are the stars who just can't stand the Jenner sisters. Everyone wants an excuse to, like, talk 
Diddy Sean Diddy Combs is clearly not a fan of the Jenner sisters, which he made apparent after the 2017 Met Gala. Combs Instagrammed a photo of himself with Jaden Smith, Travis Scott, Wiz Khalifa, and Migos at the event with the hashtag Black Excellence. But it was later revealed that Combs actually cropped Kendall and Kylie out of the photo. Diddy never commented on why he did it, but Twitter reacted swiftly to the alleged snub, with many followers applauding the rap mogul. Danielle Cash Me Outside Brigoli Notorious viral sensation Danielle Brigoli apparently has a beef with the Jenner sisters. According to the Daily Mail, Brigoli mocked Kylie in her These Hoes video, featuring a Kylie lookalike getting injections all over her face and body. Brigoli also blasted Kylie on the cruise show, saying, How do you go from lips the size of a twig and a body that looks like a paperclip, and now you look like an hourglass? <laughs> Kiki Palmer Actress and singer Kiki Palmer was somewhat sympathetic about Kylie's professed insecurities about her appearance, but Palmer doesn't approve of how Kylie went about gaining confidence, deeming her inauthentic. Palmer told Yahoo Beauty, In the situation with Kylie, a young girl people have seen on television since she was a kid and they literally told her she was so ugly. She went and did apparently everything the world deems is beautiful. The even crazier part is that everybody loves her for it. The Original Supermodels Supermodel Naomi Campbell has made it abundantly clear that she's not impressed with the trajectory of Kendall's modeling career. Campbell addressed Kendall and other so-called Instagirls, telling Meredith Vieira, I just feel my generation of women like Cindy Crawford and Linda Vandalista, Christy Turlington, Claudia, we've worked so hard and we're still working at it, you know, and then it just comes like that for them. Supermodel Stephanie Seymour also weighed in, telling Vanity Fair, Supermodels are sort of a thing of the past. Kendall and Gigi are beautiful girls, and I support all of them, but they need their own title. Bitches of the moment. That would be a good title for them. Model Rebecca Romaine had her own thoughts on Instamodels as well, telling ET, No one has proven yet that the numbers of followers translates to revenue. I know a lot of legitimate fashion people can't stand it. Hate it that these social media stars are now the supermodels in fashion. They are not true supermodels. Jeffree Star YouTube beauty guru and makeup mogul Jeffree Star started beefing with Kylie in December 2017 over her makeup kits. He began by criticizing her makeup brushes, tweeting, Are the new Kylie cosmetic makeup brushes made out of animal hair? Is that why they're so expensive? B I'm still dumbfounded. Star also accused Kylie of knocking off his brand, writing, I gotta know one thing. With all that f***ing money she's made, why did Kylie Cosmetics use the same packaging as my liquid lipsticks that have been out since 2014? Invest and make something different, maybe? That's some high-gloss shade being thrown around town. Amanda Stenberg Hunger Games actress Amanda Stenberg took Kylie to task in 2015 when the reality starlet posted an Instagram snap of herself with cornrows. Sternberg commented, When you appropriate black features and culture but fail to use your position of power to help black Americans by directing attention toward your wigs instead of police brutality or racism, hashtag white girls do it better. Kylie retorted, Amanda Stenberg, mad if I don't, mad if I do. Go hang with Jaden or something. Stenberg took Kylie's ex, Jaden Smith, to prom that May. Rihanna Insiders told OK that Rihanna beefed with Kendall over their mutual BFF, Cara Delevingne, because Riri felt like Delevingne ditched her for Kendall. A source told the mag, Rihanna finds it even more embarrassing because, to her, Kendall's just a talentless brat. A source also claimed that Rihanna wasn't thrilled with Kendall's friendship with Rihanna's abusive ex, Chris Brown. Selena Gomez Selena Gomez has had a frenemy relationship with Kendall and Kylie for years, reportedly stemming from Gomez's rocky on-again, off-again relationship with Justin Bieber. In April 2014, Gomez hung out with the Jenner sisters at the Coachella Music Festival, but according to a source in Us Weekly, at the time, Selena thought Kylie was in fact flirting with Biebs. Another source told Hollywood Life, Kylie sent sexy pics of herself to Justin and that's what started the fight. Selena saw the pictures on Justin's phone and she freaked out and left immediately. Sources told TMZ that Gomez dropped the Jenners because of their alleged drug use, drinking, and hard partying. The tab says the Jenners have denied those claims, noting that Gomez has a history of alleged substance abuse. Music industry icons In June 2017, the Jenner sisters unveiled a line of merch featuring their faces on top of images of musical icons, including Christopher Notorious B.I.G. Wallace, Tupac, The Doors, Pink Floyd, Metallica, Led Zeppelin, Kiss, and Black Sabbath. Biggie's mother, Valletta, slammed the girls on Instagram, writing, 
I have no idea why they feel they can exploit the deaths of Tupac and my son Christopher to sell a t-shirt. This is disrespectful, disgusting, and exploitation at its worst. The Jenners responded to the backlash, tweeting, We deeply apologize, especially to the families of the artists. We will use this as an opportunity to learn from these mistakes and, again, we are very sorry. But sorry wasn't enough. They would also face off against industry titans Ozzy Osbourne and The Doors. Ozzy's wife Sharon tweeted a tee that featured Ozzy's likeness, writing, Girls, you haven't earned the right to put your face with musical icons. Stick to what you know. Lip gloss. And daughter Kelly Osbourne shared her thoughts as well. But the surviving members of The Doors made it official, sending the Jenners a cease and desist letter for using their image on merch. The letter read, the superimposing of a selfie on Kendall Jenner over the iconic lion portrait of the late Jim Morrison is offensive and remarkable for its failure to recognize the rights of the estate of Mr. Morrison to control the use of his likeness. Manager of the Doors and Morrison's estate, Jeff Jampol, told Rolling Stone, They're obviously attention-seeking missiles who crave celebrity and being well-known but don't actually do anything. It's the polar opposite of the artists that they're trampling all over. It's just spitting in the face and on top of art and message and soul and legacy. Metallica frontman James Hetfield, who was peeved at the Jenner's use of Metallica on their t-shirts, summed it up best, telling ET Canada, Show some respect. Everyone's got haters, even girl next door Jennifer Lawrence. Some fans believe the actress's attempts to be super relatable are a mere marketing ploy, while others find her behavior off-putting. In addition, the Hunger Games star has managed to rack up some A-list enemies. Here are the celebs who simply can't stand J-Law. Lindsay Lohan During an appearance on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert in December 2015, Lawrence stirred up some controversy with an unexpected dig at former child star Lindsay Lohan. While chatting about a brutal stomach virus she had on the set of Joy, Lawrence said, I get like Lindsay Lohan, like, grade exhaustion. Yeah. But without any drugs or alcohol, I'm always oh, wow. in bed early. According to HuffPost, Lohan's younger sister, Allie, immediately jumped to her defense, writing in a since-deleted tweet, I never breathe life into negativity, but I stand by my family. Disappointed in Jennifer Lawrence. Not cool. Lohan then joined the conversation herself, answering her sister in a tweet that also has been removed. Thank you, sister. Maybe who you're referring to should learn to support others, like hashtag Maya Angelou. She accompanied her snarky remark with an image of a quote from late poet Maya Angelou's piece, Still I Rise. Jared Leto Lawrence presented the award for Best Actor at the 2014 Oscars, and as she took the stage, Jared Leto was apparently cracking up in his seat. Why are you laughing? What? Is this funny? Oh, okay. Leto told Access Hollywood that it had been Ellen DeGeneres making him laugh. But when he was then asked about Lawrence's red carpet fall that evening, her second Academy Awards mishap following the tumble she took while accepting the Best Actress Award a year prior, he didn't mince words. You know, I'm starting to wonder if this is, uh, this is a bit of an act. Joan Rivers At one point in a November 2013 conversation with Yahoo, the topic turned to body positivity and Lawrence's experience with body image criticism in Hollywood. In response to a question from the audience, the actress shared her distaste for Joan Rivers' hit show, Fashion Police. They put values in all the things that are wrong and that it's okay to just point at people and call them ugly and call them fat and they call it fun and welcome to the real world. Rivers was none too impressed with Lawrence's comments and took to Twitter to let the world know, clapping back. It's funny how Jennifer Lawrence loved Fashion Police during award season, when we were complimenting her every single week. She returned just a few minutes later to add, Wait, it just dawned on me why Jennifer Lawrence fell on her way up to stage to get her Oscar. She tripped over her own arrogance. In December 2013, less than a year before her passing, Rivers appeared to still have Lawrence's criticism on her mind, as she told Page Six, My New Year's resolution is ensuring Jennifer Lawrence grows up and realizes how lucky she is and calms down. Chloe Sevigny In an interview with V Magazine in 2015, actress Chloe Sevigny was asked if she ever worries about being typecast. After admitting that she does, the actress explained, So much is about marketing and selling the product. They'll have a really peppy, funny girl on the talk show rounds and everybody adores her and loves her and wants to be her or f her, and then so many more people want to watch the movie or TV show. Seveny went on to name a couple A-listers she admires, women like Angelina Jolie and Emma Stone, and at least one she could do without. She revealed, Jennifer Lawrence I find annoying, too crass. Miley Cyrus 
After calling off their engagement in 2013, Miley Cyrus and Liam Hemsworth rekindled their romance three years later. And according to a source who spoke to In Touch, it's all thanks to Jennifer Lawrence. Or rather, Cyrus's alleged jealousy. The source claimed, when Miley realized there might be something serious between Jennifer and Liam, she decided to do something to get him back. She wanted to do everything in her power to make him realize she was right for him, not Jennifer. The jealousy was likely sparked by headlines claiming that the Hunger Games co-stars were dating, and Lawrence herself didn't do much to dispel the speculation when she appeared on Watch What Happens Live in December 2015. When host Andy Cohen asked if she'd ever kissed Hemsworth off camera, Lawrence said, Liam and I grew up together. Liam's real hot. What would you have done? <laughs> I would, yes, I would say yes. Yeah. Very yeah. good, very good. <laughs> Spencer Pratt. In 2017, Lawrence told Vogue that when she moved into her new house, there were crystals all over the place, and she wanted them removed so that people didn't think she was a, quote, crystal person. People in her life warned her to wait, claiming it should be the person who put the crystals in who takes them out. But instead of listening to the advice, the actress just had all the crystals yanked out, sold them, and then my f***ing house flooded. I hate crystals. Soon after the story ran, former The Hills star Spencer Pratt announced that as a crystal lover, he felt personally attacked by Lawrence's remarks. He took to Twitter to post an image of her quote, which he captioned, Legit never seen another J-Law movie. She is over. Nicki Minaj's history of beef is so long, they should name a slaughterhouse after her. From collaborators to exes to literally anyone who mentions her name, almost no one is safe from the wrath of the queen. But not everybody takes it lying down. These are the celebs who can't stand Nicki Minaj. Grade A Cardi B Beef in December 2017, Cardi B and Nicki Minaj both appeared in a video for Motorsport, which subsequently led to boatloads of drama. In an interview with Capital Extra, Cardi B said Minaj altered her verse before the song's release. When I heard the track, right. her verse was in Finnish. Well, it's not the verse that is on right now. Minaj responded to the claim in a Beats 1 interview, claiming that Cardi B and her husband, Kiari Offset Cephas, a member of Migos, simply weren't playing fair. They'll allow people to run with the lie because it's it's entertaining to play, to, to make Nicki seem like a bad guy. And, and, and it's sad. It gets worse. In September 2018, Minaj and Cardi B got into a very public physical altercation at Harper's Bazaar annual icons party. Cardi reportedly left the party missing a shoe and sporting a huge bump over her eye that was roughly the size of a golf ball. Shortly after the fight, Cardi took to Instagram to accuse Minaj of bad-mouthing her baby. When you mention my child, all bets are f off. Meanwhile, Minaj denied any wrongdoing on her Queen radio show. I would never talk about anyone's child or parenting. I don't care about anyone's parenting. Going after Miley Cyrus. Miley Cyrus used to be a big Nicki Minaj fan. She even dressed up as the monster rapper for Halloween in 2012, and Minaj absolutely loved the costume gushing to USA Today. She is the best Nicki Minaj impersonator I've seen in my life. She's adorable. Unfortunately, this two-person mutual adoration society didn't last for long. Cyrus gave her two cents to the New York Times, saying, What I read sounded very Nicki Minaj, which, if you know Nicki Minaj, is not too kind. It's not very polite. Well, Minaj didn't let Cyrus forget those remarks at the 2015 MTV Music Video Awards. This that had a lot to say about me the other day in the press. Miley, what's good? Miley Cyrus immediately fired back at Minaj. We're all in this industry. We all do interviews and we all know how they manipulate. Nikki, congratulations. Iggy Azalea is skeptical. During her acceptance speech for Best Female Hip Hop Artist at the 2014 BET Awards, Minaj said something that was largely considered to be a huge diss on rapper Iggy Azalea. What I want the world to know about Nicki Minaj is when you hear Nicki Minaj spit, Nicki Minaj wrote it. As the New York Daily News reports, Azalea had been facing criticism for allegedly using ghostwriters for her rhymes. Minaj may have even done an impromptu Iggy Azalea impersonation. In March 2016, Azalea probably made matters worse by bringing up the beef on Watch What Happens Live. I have just as many people on my writing credi credits as she has on hers, so I don't think there's... I know I write mine. If she writes hers, I believe her too. The feud likely stems from a 2010 tweet by Azalea that mocked Nicki Minaj for, quote, saying she did the BET Awards live. Uh, if you say so, girl. Minaj responded to that tweet, writing, laughing at you can't even do. Study that formula, cornball. Mariah Carey didn't feel safe. Hey, 
moment. Oh, excuse me. The, 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 the music will cut me off if I can. I mean, oh, darling, darling, may I express this to you? Sure, Nicki Minaj and Mariah Carey collaborated on the underrated breakup song Up Out My Face in January 2010, but when they worked together again on American Idol in 2012, they were reportedly at each other's throats. Let me get off the panel. Nicki's mad, it. she's walking out. That was my move. I was gonna do that the next time she I was gonna on walk me. out. One backstage brawl allegedly involved Minaj berating Carey and threatening to quote knock her teeth out. Minaj reportedly also said, If I had a gun, I would shoot her. Multiple sources confirmed the gun remark, including Mariah Carey, who told Barbara Walters, It felt like an unsafe work environment. Anytime anybody's reeling threats at somebody. Carey said that Minaj's alleged outburst was quote not appropriate, especially since she was on the road with two babies. I'm not going to take any chances, so yeah, I did hire more security. Minaj denied ever threatening Carrie in a tweet, writing, Let's just say Nikki said something about a gun. People will believe it because she's a black rapper. In a subsequent 2015 radio interview, Carrie was asked if she'd ever come back to American Idol. Hell no. Absolutely not. That was the worst experience of my life. Well, we can't imagine why that might be. I want to lose three pounds. I know how you can. It's a quote from Mean Girls. If you knew Mean Girls, you would know. I do know Mean Girls. Lil' Kim, big fight. For decades, Lil' Kim went by Queen B after her late boyfriend, Biggie Smalls, gave her the nickname. But Nicki Minaj later took the Queen moniker for herself, which didn't make Kim very happy. During a 2018 interview with Los Angeles radio station Real 92.3, Lil' Kim said, I was named that. I never named myself that. Yeah. It's a difference. When the streets name you that, right. Biggie named me that. Mm -hmm. I didn't name myself. Lil' Kim was asked what started her beef with Minaj in a 2012 interview with Power 105's The Breakfast Club. I never had a problem with her. I was always nice with her. Always. She was a very obnoxious person, but I was always nice with her. She went on to claim Minaj copied her sound, talked smack behind her back, and, quote, wanted to be the only female rapper in the game. The feud was still simmering in June 2018 when Kim told Entertainment Tonight she didn't know Minaj, all while praising Cardi B. What do you make of Cardi B and Nicki Minaj? You know, Cardi is my girl. I don't know the other one. But Cardi is my girl, and so I'm so excited for my girl Cardi. Finally, by August 2018, Kim sounded ready to let the beef die, telling Real 92.3, God bless her. What she did, she did. But you know what? God bless her. I wish her the best. I'm past that. I'm over it. Did Minaj stab Safari Samuels? In a 2015 diss track called Lifeline, Nicki Minaj's ex Safari Samuels claimed he ghost wrote several of Minaj's lyrics on the pink print. Then in 2018, he turned around and denied he'd ghost written anything. This inspired Minaj to go off on him in an interview with Hot 97. Now, years later, you want to come back and say, oh, by the way, I lied. Years later, after you've tried to tarnish my image. In response to that interview, Samuels tweeted, That looks like someone who either still cares or just holding on to a lot of hate towards someone. That's when all hell broke loose. Minaj accused Safari Safari of stealing from her, tweeting, You stole my card and told me you thought it was an account with free money that I didn't know about. Um, then Safari responded with a tweet accusing Minaj of stabbing him. Remember the night you cut me and I almost died? The police and ambulance had to take me out the crib on a stretcher, and I had to lie and tell them I was trying to kill myself so they wouldn't take you to jail? Minaj never actually denied cutting Samuels, opting instead to change the subject to hair restoration. Travis Scott's Minaj Problem when Travis Scott's album Astro World dropped a week and 12 hours before Nicki Minaj's record Queen, it blocked her from having a number one debut. Minaj was furious. She even pointed the finger at Scott's wife, Kylie Jenner, and their baby, Stormy Webster, for promoting the album, tweeting, I put my blood, sweat, and tears in writing a dope album only for Travis Scott to have Kylie Jenner post a tour pass telling people to come see her and Stormy. After all Minaj's ranting, TMZ reported that Scott and Jenner had their seats moved away from Minaj at the MTV Video Music Awards. In fact, video footage even reportedly showed Jenner pivoting away from Minaj on the red carpet. Awkward. Oprah Winfrey is so universally beloved that after her blockbuster acceptance speech at the Golden Globes in January 2018, there was speculation that she might actually run for President of the United States. That said, not everyone is a fan. Whether these hard feelings are behind them or not, at one point, the following celebs couldn't stand Winfrey. Seal It's safe to assume that Winfrey wouldn't get Seal's vote in the next election cycle. Just days after the Golden Globes, the singer posted a meme on Instagram with Winfrey cozying up to disgraced movie mogul Harvey Weinstein. Seal captioned the post, 
Oh, I forgot, that's right. You'd heard the rumors, but you had no idea he was actually serially assaulting young, starry-eyed actresses who in turn had no idea what they were getting into. My bad. Angelina Jolie You'd think that two humanitarians would get along, but that's reportedly not the case with Winfrey and Angelina Jolie. An insider said Jolie refused to help Winfrey launch her Oprah Winfrey Leadership Academy for Girls in South Africa. A source told Star Magazine in 2007, Oprah thought Angelina would jump at the chance because she knows how much Angelina loves Africa. Oprah says it's the last time she'll ask Angelina to help with any of her causes. The source added, Angelina has never forgiven Oprah for siding with Jennifer Aniston after Brad Pitt split from Jen. Joan Rivers the late Joan Rivers fat-shamed the talk queen on The Tonight Show in 1985 during Winfrey's first-ever national TV appearance. So how'd you gain the weight? I ate a lot. <laughs> you said 50 pounds. You shouldn't let that happen to you. You're very pretty. You know what? No, I don't want to hear. Winfrey recalled the incident in her book Food, Health and Happiness, writing, Wait a minute. Did she just use my national television debut to ask me why I was so fat? A source told the National Enquirer that Rivers loathed Winfrey, with one insider saying, She feels Oprah's real gift is exploiting people's suffering and emotions and turning them into TV ratings. 50 Cent Rapper 50 Cent referred to Winfrey as an Oreo in the January 2006 issue of Elle magazine, complaining that the talk queen started out with black women's views but has been catering to middle-aged white American women for so long that she's become one herself. When Winfrey got a chance to talk it out with him, the rapper explained that he took issue with Winfrey's lack of hip-hop artists on her show. I would see moments where you would discuss your, your feelings on, on the culture. Yeah. And everything that was wrong with the culture was what was on my CD. When Oprah explained that she was referring to things like the N-word, misogynist views against women, and violence, 50 Cent revealed why he really spoke out against her at the time. What I was saying, if I can't be a friend, at least let me be your enemy so I coexist. Ice Cube Rapper Ice Cube felt ostracized by Winfrey because he was never invited on her show, despite many of his cinematic co-stars being invited to chat with her on air. He told FHM in July 2006, For Barbershop, she had Cedric the Entertainer and Eve on, but I wasn't invited. Maybe she's got a problem with hip-hop. She's had damn rapists, child molesters, and lying authors on her show. And if I'm not a rags-to-riches story for her, who is? I've gotten this far without Oprah, so... I'm not worried about it. Chris Brown Singer-songwriter Chris Brown had a mild war of words with Winfrey after she aired a domestic violence episode following his brutal assault on then-girlfriend Rihanna in 2009. He will hit you again. That's right. After it aired, Brown told People, I commend Oprah on being like, this is a problem, but it was a slap in my face. I did a lot of stuff for Winfrey, like going to Africa and performing for her school. She could have been more helpful, like, okay, I'm going to help both of these people out. Winfrey's rep issued a statement to TMZ, noting, Oprah is very appreciative that Chris Brown performed at her school, but she takes domestic abuse very seriously. She hopes he gets the counseling he needs. Miley Cyrus may have a lot of fans, but she's also made some enemies, too. Join us as we take a look at some of the celebrities who apparently can't stand the singer formerly known as Hannah Montana. Prior to the 2015 MTV Video Music Awards, rapper Nicki Minaj posted a series of tweets criticizing the lack of nominations for women of color, writing, Black women influence pop culture so much but are rarely rewarded for it. VMA's host Miley Cyrus later told the New York Times she felt the complaints were more about Minaj herself than broader race issues. What I read sounded very Nicki Minaj, which, if you know Nicki Minaj, is not too kind. It's not very polite. When the two met face-to-face -face at the VMAs, Minaj concluded an acceptance speech with, Back to this b that had a lot to say about me in the press the other day, Miley, what's good? If you thought the drama was over, think again. Q Cyrus's 2019 track, Catitude, which seemingly referenced Minaj's former feud with Cardi B with the lyric, I love you, Nikki, but I listen to Cardi. While Cyrus claimed on Capital Breakfast, I don't actually think there is beef now anymore. Minaj responded on Queen Radio, 
a Purdue chicken can never talk about queens. After Miley Cyrus's headline-making 2013 VMAs performance, former American Idol winner Kelly Clarkson didn't hold back. In a since-deleted tweet via the Daily Mail, Clarkson wrote, "...just saw a couple of performances from the VMAs last night, two words, hashtag pitchy strippers." Cyrus did not respond to the tweet, but at the time, Cyrus's fans jumped into Clarkson's mentioned. One person wrote, Kelly Clarkson called Miley a pitchy stripper. Do you think she's mad because her past few singles flopped and wasn't asked to perform? I don't seem calm, but this is really calm for me. I feel very calm and you very calm, like peaceful. Yeah. In 2019, Clarkson covered Cyrus's mega-hit Wrecking Ball on her talk show, perhaps signaling an end to the alleged feud. Plenty of celebrities had thoughts on Miley Cyrus's 2013 VMAs performance, but no celebrity went completely in on the performance quite like music and film legend Cher. To say she ripped it to shreds would be an understatement. Cher told USA Today, "...she can't dance, her body looked like hell, the song wasn't great, one cheek was hanging out, and chick, don't stick out your tongue if it's coated." We wonder if there were any aliens who could see this nuclear take from orbit. Who can forget that line, and the Jay-Z song was on, in the earworm that was Cyrus's smash hit Party in the USA. However, in a 2019 interview on Miley World Web, she was asked which Hove song inspired one of her biggest hits. Incredibly, she replied, "...I've never heard a Jay-Z song. I don't listen to pop music." She went on to say that she didn't write the song, but instead, "...I chose it because I needed something to go with my clothing line." It took four years for the legendary rapper to respond, but when he did, he did so in typical Jay-Z fashion. On the 2013 track, Somewhere in America, Jay-Z raps, "...they see I'm still putting work in, cause somewhere in America, Miley Cyrus is still twerking." Was Jay-Z making a sarcastic dig, or is he a fan? You be the judge. In 2014, Katy Perry supported Miley Cyrus on tour, and in what we assume was a delight to the audience, Cyrus apparently crawled over to Perry's front row seat and offered up a playful kiss. At least, that's what Perry thought it was going to be. The I Kissed a Girl singer told an Australian talk show soon after, "...I just walked up to her to give her, like, a friendly girly kiss. And then she, like, tried to move her head and go deeper, and I pulled away. God knows where that tongue has been. We don't know." That tongue is so infamous. It's definitely going to be lively. Cyrus shot back on Twitter, making reference to Perry's ex, John Mayer, and his tongue. She wrote, "...girl, if you're worried about where tongues have been, good thing your ex-boo is your ex-boo, cause we all know where that tongue has been." John Mayer would probably like to be excluded from this narrative. During 2013, Sir Elton John had some harsh criticisms of the young starlet. He told the Australian, "...I look at Miley Cyrus and I see a meltdown waiting to happen, and she's so young. But she's got two records in the top 20, so who is going to stop her?" Cyrus has chilled out a bit since then, and a mere five years later, she joined John on stage to perform his classic hit, Tiny Dancer, at the 60th annual Grammys. Legendary comedian Joan Rivers spent the latter part of her stellar career calling out celebrities for their fashion faux pas on her show Fashion Police. So did you really think she'd treat Miley Cyrus's 2013 VMAs outfits any differently? In an interview with OK Magazine, the late television host didn't hold back, calling Cyrus's choice of fashion disgusting. Rivers also accused Cyrus of being a poor role model, telling Entertainment Tonight, no, this is not normal behavior for a 20-year-old. This is just disgraceful. It makes me very sad, too, because she could have been such a role model and she could have achieved the sexiness without going through all this insanity." But Rivers wasn't quite done with her critique of Cyrus just yet. She dressed up as the singer for Halloween in an inflated suit with her best representation of Cyrus's VMAs outfit. That's some serious shade, folks. Former Full House star Jody Sweeten had a very public battle with drug and alcohol addiction. In her 2009 memoir, Unsweetened, the actress admitted she started drinking at 14 before moving on to cocaine and ecstasy. Sweeten entered recovery in 2008 and has since earned her degree as a drug and alcohol counselor. According to E! News, in 2016, Miley Cyrus posted a now-deleted Instagram photo of Sweeten during her time as an addict with the caption, "...current mood, hashtag Fuller House." When E! News asked Sweeten about Cyrus's dig, she responded with nothing but positivity. 
I don't pay attention to negative stuff. I have so much good stuff going on in my life right now that I try not to pay attention. As Taylor Swift would say, sometimes it's best just to shake it off. The 2020 presidential election signaled waning American support for then-President Donald Trump. While he's developed friendships with many celebs throughout his career, those friendships changed when Trump ran for president. Here are a few famous former supporters. Clay Aiken got to know Donald Trump when Aiken appeared as a contestant on Celebrity Apprentice. Aiken didn't endorse Trump in 2016, but he did speak positively about his apprentice boss's candidacy early in the process, telling Billboard in August 2015, anybody who discounts him is short-sighted. Aiken, who ran for Congress as a Democrat in 2014, never agreed with Trump on politics, but looked upon him fondly. The singer told Fox Business in March 2016, I like him as a person. I always say he's like the uncle that gets drunk at the wedding and embarrasses you. You still love him, but you wish he'd shut up. Fast forward to August 2017, and Aiken changed his tune, posting an apology on Twitter for having defended Trump against accusations of racism, and later added a tweet clarifying that his stance on Trump as president was always negative. Caitlyn Jenner says she received more flack for coming out as a Republican than she did for coming out as transgender. Still, she supported Donald Trump's candidacy in 2016. In April 2017, Jenner said on Late Night with Seth Meyers that she had spoken with Trump about LGBTQ plus issues before the inauguration and was disappointed that during his first month in office, he repealed the protections granted to transgender students via Title IX. Jenner insisted her ultimate loyalty is with the LGBTQ plus plus community, but that she doesn't vote based on only those issues, stating, I believe in little things like the Constitution and freedom. I believe in minimal government. Republicans have done a better job in that direction. Jenner also told Myers she refused an invitation to play golf with Trump after the Title IX action, but admitted it was largely because the community wouldn't respond well to a public outing with Trump. Even staunch conservative Jenner finally had enough when in July 2017, Trump banned transgender people from serving in the military. In an opinion piece for the Washington Post, Jenner admitted she was wrong in thinking Trump would support the LGBTQ plus community and said Trump treated them as political pawns. Another Kardashian clan member, Kanye West, lent his support to Donald Trump in the 2016 election, much to the dismay of many fans. West met with Trump during the presidential transition period to discuss multicultural issues, but their communication did not end there, nor did West's support for Trump. Praise for Trump would pop up on West's social media throughout much of Trump's four-year term, to the appreciation of POTUS, but ultimately disappeared in July 2020. The Yeezy designer said in a revealing interview with Forbes, that he no longer supports Trump. Just a few days before the Forbes article was released, West announced via a tweet he would be running for president, but ultimately dropped out of the race. West's presidential run was widely panned as a spoiler campaign intended to siphon black voters from Joe Biden, which West ultimately admitted to Forbes was true. Former WWE wrestler Jesse the Body Ventura isn't a fan of politicians in either of the two major parties, but the former Minnesota governor is an old friend of Donald Trump. By October 2020, though, Ventura had simply had enough. A staunch independent, Ventura wrote an opinion piece for CNBC in July 2016 about his support of libertarian presidential candidate Gary Johnson, but the former wrestler's allegiance was a bit more nebulous in 2015. CNN reports he made some complimentary remarks about Trump's candidacy, in a relatively transparent attempt to entice Trump to select him as his vice presidential running mate. He wrote a piece for Time in August 2016 saying he's happy to see Trump destroying the GOP. Ventura has been compared to Trump in recent years, a comparison he does not seem to like. In November 2018, he told NPR News, it's hogwash. Ventura's former chief of staff shot it down more emphatically, saying, Jesse Ventura is colorful. He's not correct. Tom Brady, great guy, great. Trump supported Brady throughout Deflategate, and the quarterback, in kind, supported his friend's presidential candidacy. In September 2015, CNN reported a Make America Great Again hat had been photographed in Brady's locker. Asked by reporters whether he thought Trump has what it takes to become president, Brady answered, I hope so, that would be great. But Trump's comments about the NFL players kneeling during the national anthem to protest police brutality put Brady in a tough spot. After the Patriots won Super Bowl 51, 
1981, Brady did not attend the White House ceremony with other members of the team. In a tit-for-tat, Trump didn't mention Brady's name that day. In September 2017, Brady spoke with WEEI's radio show, Kirk and Callahan, where he revealed that he thought Trump's rhetoric on the issue was divisive and that he supported his teammates. Former Republican California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger withdrew his support for Donald Trump following the release of the infamous Access Hollywood tape. He released a statement on Twitter that read, For the first time since I became a citizen in 1983, I will not vote for the Republican candidate for president. But the chasm between Schwarzenegger and Trump was more complicated than a mere celebrity feud, because Schwarzenegger took over as host of The Apprentice in 2016. Then-President-elect Trump went on a Twitter rant against the governing in January 2017, touting his own previous high ratings as host of the show and criticizing his replacement's performance. The ratings went right down the tubes. It's been a total disaster. The feuding continued. In March 2017, in a video posted to Twitter, Schwarzenegger admonished Trump and trolled him about his then 37% approval ratings, saying, I mean, when you take away after-school programs for children and Meals on Wheels for the poor people, that's not what you call making America great again. Come on. I mean, who is advising you? The Friday after the 2016 election, Dave Chappelle did a stand-up set at The Cutting Room in New York, in which he said he had voted for Hillary Clinton but wasn't particularly pleased about it. HuffPost reports Jared Kushner's newspaper, The Observer, published an article framing Chappelle's set that night as being pro-Trump. After the Observer article made its rounds, Chappelle felt he needed to set the record straight. His representative released a statement saying, Dave is disgusted by the tone of the election and especially by the idea that his comedy would be misconstrued to defend Trump. Chappelle hosted Saturday Night Live the following week and did his best to take the high road, saying on air, I'm wishing Donald Trump luck and I'm going to give him a chance. And we, the historically disenfranchised, demand that he gives us one too. Sadly, Trump never lived up to Chappelle hopes, and he's since revisited it in later interviews and specials. I don't know what I said, but whatever I said, I, I really wish I didn't say that <laughs> Breaking Bad actor Brian Cranston didn't vote for Trump in 2016 and was outspoken about his opposition to Trump during the campaign. Nine months into Trump's presidency, Cranston struck a more optimistic tone when talking with The Hollywood Reporter, saying, If Trump fails, the country is in jeopardy. It would be egotistical for anyone to say, I hope he fails. To that person, I would say, F*** you. Why would you want that? So you can be right? I don't want him to fail. I want him to succeed. I do. I honestly do. The actor held the supportive line behind Trump's presidency for a while, but as time went on, he began to question the president's sanity. In April 2020, amid the frenzy surrounding Trump's comments about injecting disinfectant as a possible treatment for COVID-19, Cranston tweeted, I've stopped worrying about the president's sanity. He's not sane. And the realization of his illness doesn't fill me with anger, but with profound sadness. What I now worry about is the sanity of anyone who can still support this deeply troubled man to lead our our country. Musician Aaron Carter tweeted his support for Donald Trump's candidacy in February 2016, which sparked a contentious back and forth with his fans. The rapper told People in April 2016 that the fans harassing him for his support of Trump don't understand politics, saying, I'm too intelligent for you guys. He later admitted, though, that he didn't support all of Trump's policies, like those on immigration and LGBTQ plus issues, and ultimately stated in a since-deleted tweet, I have decided I will not be voting for Donald Trump. I've seen a lot, and to me, it's just something I can't take part in. Too many reasons. Omarosa Manigault's Newman is nothing if not entertaining. From the moment she appeared on the first season of The Apprentice, lying and scheming her way through the challenges, with her eyes firmly affixed on the prize, she was the villain we love to hate. And she never really shook that label, even after another two seasons of The Apprentice. And stints as a presidential campaign advisor and director of communications for the White House Office of Public Liaison. When that ended, she recorded her firing and subsequent phone conversation with Trump and came out swinging with promises of truth to be revealed in her subsequent tell-all. Trump tweeted some insults at her in retaliation, and Good Morning America's Robin Roberts gave Omarosa a send-off befitting a villain, ending a segment about her firing with, She said she has a story to tell, and I'm sure she'll be selling that story. We'll see. Well, yeah, she will. Bye, Felicia. 
Jennifer Lopez seems to have just as much staying power as her diva reputation. And although much of the bad press comes from tabloid speculation, some of her celebrity cohorts might actually agree with those unflattering rumors. These celebs have had it up to here with Jenny from the block. It's, I'm the only one that's not crying. The Lopez Carey feud has played out since the early 2000s, and it all began with four little words Mariah Carey once uttered to a reporter when she said of Lopez, I don't know her. When Andy Cohen brought up the beef in 2014, Lopez played the whole thing off, saying, I don't have a feud against her at all. Um, I know from back in the day I've read things that she said about me <laughs> that were, you know, not the greatest. She claimed the two truly don't know each other, but added, I would love to meet her and I would love to be friends with her. I but she sang quite the different tune with Wendy Williams in 2016. We've met many times. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know her that well. Following Carrie's disastrous New Year's Eve performance that December, Lopez found an opportunity to throw a little shade when a user posted, Ever seen an accident you couldn't take your eyes away from? That was her tonight. Lopez liked the post. Nicki Minaj and Lopez first exchanged jabs in 2012 on American Idol when Minaj performed and Lopez was a judge. After the rapper finished her set, she asked, I was hoping maybe I could come back and be a guest judge. JLo, can you scoot over a little bit? Things got even icier when Lopez quipped back, I don't know if there's enough room for both of us. And I was like, meh. Fast forward to 2015 and things between the two didn't seem to be any better. When Lopez opened the American Music Awards with a medley of songs that included an excerpt from Nicki Minaj's Anaconda, Minaj looked like she wasn't having it. But when a fan tweeted the clip and proclaimed, Damn JLo, Nicki Minaj's facial expression says it all. Minaj fired back, saying, LOL, says what all? I'm looking at my own face on the screen when I'm looking to the right. I turn back and look at her. I want to say, but it would be so real that I can't. Almost as soon as Lopez shared a snap of herself chilling with Drake backstage at her Vegas show in 2016, rumors flew that the two were dating. And Lopez sure didn't help matters when she then posted a pic of the rapper giving her a cozy bear hug. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that it's, it's, it's a maybe one day, maybe, maybe not. While some didn't believe the hype, Drake's sometimes love interest Rihanna sure seemed to take the posts to heart. An unnamed insider told In Touch she felt like she had suffered what she called the ultimate betrayal, calling Lopez, quote, desperate. Although Rihanna never publicly addressed the issue, she threw some major shade when, in 2016, she unfollowed Lopez on Instagram. Despite both being Puerto Rican American dancers who grew up in New York, according to Rosie Perez's 2014 memoir, Handbook for an Unpredictable Life, the ladies sure don't get along. Perez recalled their time working on In Living Color, saying, All of the girls were coming into my office complaining how Lopez was manipulating wardrobe, makeup, and me all to her advantage. <laughs> I'll never tell. I'll never tell. Although Lopez left the show after just two seasons, Perez accused the star of keeping their feud alive long after they parted ways. Once when they crossed paths in a Hollywood club, Perez wrote, Lopez came over to me smiling, saying hello as if nothing had happened. I should have let it go, played it off too. Instead, I killed her with my biting tongue. But we don't see each other and that's okay too. We're mm -hmm. two grown adults that have moved on. Lopez and Jenna Dewan seemed to get along just fine when they both appeared on NBC's World of Dance. The two dancers never showed any signs of animosity on camera, but according to OK Magazine, the vibe was very different behind the scenes. It's a battle. We gotta bring it. You can't act bring it to a battle. A source told the outlet, Jenna can't stand Jen's over-the-top theatrical fakery. Jen never fails to ham it up when the cameras are rolling and she hijacks the show. Every situation, even off-camera, is micromanaged by J-Lo and Jenna feels very excluded. But the alleged feud may need to be taken with a big grain of salt. Gossip Cop reportedly reached out to a show producer as well as Dewan's rep and was told that the reports of a beef were absolutely not true. Where are you going, snacks? Anybody?
Lady Gaga has millions of little monsters around the world, but celebrities on this list probably aren't in their ranks. The bad romance singer has had so many beefs she could practically make a meat dress out of them. Here are stars who can't stand Mother Monster, even if a few publicly came around to say otherwise. In the beginning of Gaga's career, Perez Hilton was one of her biggest champions, but the celebrity blogger changed his tune a few years later, telling an Australian TV show in June 2014 that the catalyst was a 2011 interview gone awry. Hilton claimed a question he asked Gaga about her then-boyfriend set the songstress off, saying, And the fact that I even brought up that she had a boyfriend made her livid, and she stormed off the set and stopped the interview. Gaga's interpretation was pretty different, though the timeline matched up in terms of the ill-fated 2011 interview. The Born This Way singer told Howard Stern in a November 2013 interview, he started asking me really terrible questions, and he was being very negative about Born This Way, and we had a lot to drink. He was supposed to be my friend, and I felt betrayed, so I started crying. He's just mad that I don't want to hang out anymore because I don't want to be around fake people. Lady Gaga was slated to collaborate with rapper Azalea Banks on a track called Red Flame for Art Pop, but the song was never officially released and didn't make the album. Banks then accused Gaga of stealing the track, even though Mother Monster never actually released it. The Chasing Time rapper also went as far to accuse Gaga of copying mermaid aesthetics from her and alleged that the title of her third studio album, Art Pop, was stolen from her own self-proclaimed genre name, Witch Hop. Gaga never responded directly to Banks but did tell fans in 2013 she has a bad attitude. Not to be outdone, Banks mocked Gaga for supporting Hillary Clinton in the 2016 election. Lady Gaga was accused of copying the Queen of Pop for much of her career, but Madonna never actually commented on it until a 2020 interview in January 2012. When asked specifically about Gaga's song Born This Way, which is often compared to Madonna's Express Yourself, Madonna decided to reveal how she really felt, tea and all. It feels uh, reductive. Is that good? Look it up. Madonna kept quiet until February 2015 when she sassed to Rolling Stone, The only time I ever criticized Lady Gaga was when I felt like she blatantly ripped off one of my songs. It was just that one issue. And everybody's obviously run with it and turned it into a huge feud, which I think is really boring. I don't care anymore. Lady Gaga and Christina Aguilera get along beautifully now and even collaborated on a remix of Gaga's song, Do What You Want, but they had a pretty vicious history thanks to their respective teams. Aguilera seemed to start the beef, telling the Los Angeles Times in November 2008, This person, Lady Gaga, was just brought to my attention not too long ago. I'm not quite sure who this person is, to be honest. I don't know if it is a man or a woman. I just wasn't sure. Uh, rude. A month later, Gaga reportedly responded to Aguilera's comments by saying, well, it was very flattering when it happened. A lot of people in America didn't know who I was until that whole thing happened. It really put me on the map in a way. Well, that's one way to look at it. In June 2010, Lady Gaga caused a stir when she sat in Jerry Seinfeld's box at a New York Mets game wearing only a bra, cheeky shorts, and raised her middle finger at the crowd. Unsurprisingly, Seinfeld wasn't at all impressed with Gaga's antics. The funny man later said, I'm not one of these all-publicity-is-good people. I don't understand how this is good for her, but I'm sure she understands her milieu better than I ever could." The comedian continued by lamenting stardom and publicity in the 21st century, saying, "...I don't know what these young people think or how they promote their careers. Wake me when it's over. Get an act. Rhinestone bikinis and giving people the finger. She is talented. I don't know why she's doing this stuff." Lady Gaga has used her platform to open up about her experience with sexual assault in an effort to encourage and inspire fellow survivors, even though it hasn't always been easy for her to do so. I suffer from PTSD. I've never told anyone that before, so here we are. However, in December 2016, Piers Morgan took to Twitter to attack Lady Gaga's claims that she suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of her experience. The host tweeted, Lady Gaga and Madonna have both made allegations of rape many years after the event. No police complaint, no charges, no court case. I fear sexual assault has become the latest celebrity accessory. I wouldn't automatically believe anything either Madonna or Lady Gaga claimed about their lives. Gaga replied, If anyone in your family suffers from PTSD, I pray they have more good days than bad. It has affected me and my whole family. I would also love to talk to you about PTSD. It's not just a military disorder. There is a mental health youth epidemic. 
Morgan responded claiming that because he comes from a big military family, he gets angry when he feels a celebrity is using PTSD to promote themselves. The pair then agreed to have a sit-down interview, to which Morgan said, I'll press my meat suit. Gaga clapped back, If you continue to shame me in the process of kindly agreeing to interview with you, I'll happily do the interview with someone else. Of course, the interview has yet to happen as of the making of this video, and Morgan has since publicly said he regretted causing a conflict with the pop star in the first place. When Amber Heard accused Johnny Depp of domestic violence, Depp got some defense from some unexpected people, including several ex-girlfriends. And they're not the only celebs who have spoken out against Amber Heard. Alec Baldwin and Kim Basinger's daughter, Island Baldwin, didn't hold back on social media when speaking about Amber Heard, Johnny Depp, and his defamation lawsuit. In a post shared on her Instagram stories, Island shared an audio clip of Heard seemingly admitting that she hit Depp along with a statement suggesting she was more than familiar with the type of person who would do that. In her post, Island brought up the idea of manipulative women who use their gender to falsify abuse allegations in the hope that society will support them over the man that they're accusing. She wasn't shy in calling out Heard as allegedly being this kind of person, writing, Men can experience abuse too, and this absolute disaster of a human being is a terrible person. I hope Johnny gets his reputation and his life back, and I hope he's in like five Pirates movies." Baldwin was referring to Depp's claims in court that Heard's allegations of abuse cost him his career and his reputation. Once in high demands, the actor was dropped by Disney and the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise following his ex-wife's allegations. But then suddenly I was guilty until proven innocent. Johnny Depp's former partner and the mother of his children, Vanessa Paradis, also jumped in to defend him against Amber Heard's allegations of abuse. The couple met in Paris in 1998, and they were together for 14 years. In 2016, TMZ obtained a copy of a statement that Paradis wrote to defend Depp, in which she praised the integrity of her ex. She wrote, I believe with all my heart that these recent allegations being made are outrageous. In all the years I have known Johnny, he has never been physically abusive with me, and this looks nothing like the man I lived with for 14 wonderful years. In 2022, Depp made claims during his witness testimony that his daughter, Lily Rose Depp, didn't get along with Heard, stating how she didn't attend the couple's wedding. The actor explained, She and Miss Heard were not on particularly great terms for several reasons. In 2010, Johnny Depp and Paul Bettany formed a friendship while filming the romantic thriller The Tourist. Paul Bettany is a good friend, yes. Six years later, the British star took to Twitter to defend his former co-star following Amber Heard's allegations against him, stating that he'd known the actor for years. Bettany wrote, He's the sweetest, kindest, gentlest man that I've ever known. Curiously, the friendship between the pair came up during the defamation trial between Depp and Heard. The two men occasionally exchanged text messages about Depp's relationship. And during some of the correspondence, the Edward Scissorhand star reportedly joked about killing his ex-wife. After Depp quips that they could set fire to Heard, Bettany darkly wisecracked that they could drown her instead, to see if she was a witch. In response, Depp wrote, Let's drown her before we burn her. Days later, the actor shared in court that his ex-wife never got along with Bettany. The actor alleged that Heard hated the close friendship he shared with the WandaVision star and that it was a source of conflict in the relationship. Depp also claimed that the two once got into an argument so heated that she made Bettany's 18-year-old son cry. In October 2020, singer Sia jumped on Twitter to show her support for Johnny Depp and to critique Amber Heard while she was at it. The Australian star shared a link to a YouTube video titled Amber Heard and Johnny Depp, The Real Abuser Finally Revealed, which claimed to feature uncensored audio of an argument between the two. Sia followed up the tweet with another which suggested she saw Depp as a true victim. A third and final tweet made reference to the $7 million Heard was said to have made in her 2016 divorce settlement, which she claimed to have donated to charity. Depp later alleged his ex-wife was lying about having done so. Sierra alleged that Heard's ex-boyfriend, Elon Musk, was somehow involved and addressed the tweet to him directly, writing, Didn't you give her the $7 million she donated from her settlement? She still came out $7 million richer. Why are you protecting her? She would never get the help she needs if we all stay silent. Musk and Heard started dating in 2016, following her split from Depp, but the relationship ended after a year. Laura Wasser, a California-based attorney in family law, has carved out an incredible career representing celebrities in their divorces. The high-profile attorney has worked on several celebrity divorce cases, including the one between Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. 
Given her stellar reputation, it's unsurprising that Deb also retained her during his divorce, and she certainly didn't hold back against Amber Heard during proceedings. After Heard was granted a temporary restraining order against her ex-husband, Wasser responded by alleging that Heard's behavior was driven by a monetary agenda. In legal documents shared by CNN, the attorney claimed, Amber is attempting to secure a premature financial resolution by alleging abuse. She further suggested that the star was acting in response to negative reports that had started circulating about her following news of the couple's divorce proceedings. After meeting in 1989, Johnny Depp and Winona Ryder's romance lasted for four years and included an engagement. The two were wildly and outspokenly in love with each other, with Depp telling people in 1990, "...there's been nothing in my 27 years that's comparable to the feeling I have with Winona." For Ryder, the impact was equally earth-shaking. Speaking to Cinema.com about the impact of the relationship, she appeared to stop short of suggesting it was a tough one to get over. Ryder told the outlet, I had my first real relationship with Johnny Depp, a fiercely deep love. In 2020, those feelings likely prompted Ryder to step up in defending the character of her first love. In a statement, the Heather star suggested she was deeply upset by the domestic violence allegations made by Amber Heard against the actor. She took care in discussing the issues, writing, I do not want to call anyone a liar, but from my experience of Johnny, it is impossible to believe that such horrific allegations are true. Ryder also added that Depp was never violent or abusive towards her, nor had she ever witnessed him exhibit such behavior against others. If you or someone you know is dealing with domestic abuse, you can call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233. You can also find more information, resources, and support at their website. Steven Seagal's skills in martial arts helped him have a successful career as a big-screen action star, but he's also been famous for offensive and bizarre behavior. With that in mind, here are the celebs who just can't stand Steven Seagal. For Don Leguizamo, an ugly on-set encounter with Steven Seagal was so memorable that it became part of his 2011 one-man Broadway show, Ghetto Clown. As he recalled in an interview with the AV Club, during the first day of rehearsals for the 1996 thriller Executive Decision, he witnessed Seagal declaring to his co-stars, I'm in command, what I say is law. Leguizamo found this hilarious, as he put it, I started laughing and he slammed me with an Aikido elbow against a brick wall and knocked all the air out of me. I dropped to the ground and all I could say was, why? Why? Legazamo later reenacted the story in Ghetto Clown, and when Seagal caught wind of this mockery, he reportedly threatened to punch out Legazamo if he ever encountered him on a red carpet. As Legazamo summed it up to The Observer, I don't think he's invited to a lot of red carpets. He then added, how'd you become such a putz? How'd you become such an egomaniacal diva? Steven Seagal hosted the April 20th, 1991 episode of Saturday Night Live, and he's since remained notorious as the most disliked host in the show's history. In the oral history book Live from New York, Tim Meadows, who was a cast member at the time, claimed, "...the biggest problem with Steve Seagal was that he would complain about jokes that he didn't get. So it was like, you can't explain something to someone in German if they don't speak German. He just wasn't funny." And he was very critical of the cast and the writing staff. Another cast member, Julia Sweeney, had a similar recollection when she appeared on HuffPost Live. Steven Seagal was so horrible on such a scale. It was such a huge scale <laughs> of terribleness that it was undeniable. Sweeney also recalled a time that Seagal locked himself in his dressing room because he was unhappy with a sketch implying that the over-the-top bodybuilder characters Hans and Franz could beat him up. According to her, it was really legendary craziness. David Spade added his perspective when he appeared on a 2015 episode of Watch What Happens Live. He was tough to work with. He was hard. He did not want to play along. Seagal's stint was so legendarily awful that it ended up being referenced on future episodes. When Nicolas Cage hosted in 1992, his monologue featured him making some insensitive comments that led him to worry that viewers would think he was the biggest jerk who's ever been on the show. But lucky for him, SNL producer Lorne Michaels was there to set him straight. No, no, that would be Steven Seagal. Well <laughs> 
Early in her career, Juliana Margulies had an uncomfortable encounter with Steven Seagal. Just 23 at the time, she was told by a casting director that Seagal wanted her to join him to rehearse a scene for a callback the next day. It would take place in his hotel room at 10 o'clock that night. Margulies recalled what happened next in an interview on the Next Question with Katie Couric podcast, as she claimed, I walked in and I sat down and I jumped right back up because there was something very uncomfortable and hard in the couch. He laughed and he said, oh, sorry, that must have been my gun. Her first instinct was getting so angry at herself for being stupid enough to place herself in a hotel room alone with a guy who turned out to have a gun. She thankfully beat a hasty retreat, but she also wound up nabbing the role, which was for the 1991 action thriller Out for Justice. However, she wasn't exactly suddenly comfortable with her co-star. After being cast, she told the producers, I'd really appreciate it if no one would ever let me be in the room alone with him. Portia de Rossi is known for acting on TV shows like Ally McBeal and Arrested Development, and she's also famous as the wife of daytime talk show queen Ellen DeGeneres. But before all that, she was an aspiring young actress, angling for a role in one of Steven Seagal's action movies. In 2017, she took to Twitter to recall how she was called in for a final audition in Seagal's office. As she alleged, he told me how important it was to have chemistry off screen as he sat me down and unzipped his leather pants. I ran out and called my agent. Unfazed, she replied, well, I didn't know if he was your type. DeGeneres showed her support for her spouse by retweeting her and adding the note, I'm proud of my wife. Jenny McCarthy is yet another actress who had an unpleasant experience while auditioning for a part in a Steven Seagal movie. In this case, it was 1995's Under Siege 2, Dark Territory. She first came forward with her allegations in a 1998 interview with Movie Line. She was ready to read with her script in hand when Seagal told her that he wanted to get to know her first. After asking her about being Playboy's Playmate of the Year, he requested that she stand up. She recalled, I stand up and he goes, take off your dress. I said, what? And he said, Said, there's nudity. I said, no, there's not, or I wouldn't be here right now. He said again, there's nudity, and I said, the pages are right in front of me. There's no nudity. He goes, take off your dress. I just started crying and said, rent my Playboy video, you and ran out to the car. She continued, I'm closing my car door and he grabs me and says, don't you ever tell anybody. He won't sue me or say anything because he knows it's true. If I saw him today, I would still say, you're a f and I really hope you change your ways. The day I become famous, I am going to shout it to the world. And two years later, I did. Not only is Ronda Rousey a UFC champion and a professional wrestler, she also happens to be close with Jean LaBelle, the martial arts expert and Hollywood stunt legend who allegedly choked out Steven Seagal on a movie set to the point that Seagal had an embarrassing accident in his pants. Rousey's no fan of Seagal herself, and she was happy to spend some time trash-talking him during a chat for MMA Interviews.tv. As she put it, Jean LaBelle would destroy Steven Seagal again, even as old as they are now. I'd still put my money on him to this day. She also warned Seagal that he'd be wise to have some fresh underwear on standby if she ever ran into him, as she added, I don't want to give anyone another quote, but I bet I could. Hell yeah. You know what? If he says anything bad about Jean to my face, I would be forced to do something. Of course I would. I would have to make him crap his pants a second time. Steven Seagal's rivalry with Jean-Claude Van Damme dates back at least as far as the 90s when Seagal was asked about his fellow action star's status as a martial arts champion while on the Arsenio Hall show. As far as Seagal saw it, that champion status may not have been legitimate. I think that that's a matter of opinion, that he was a champion anywhere. You know. <laughs> In a later interview, Seagal was asked if he thought Van Damme had the skills to back him up in a real-life altercation, to which he responded, Can I laugh in your face? There was also a moment in an episode of the reality show Steven Seagal Lawman in which Seagal scoffed at the notion of fighting Van Damme and claimed that it would be like him squashing an ant. But not everyone sees it that way. Sylvester Stallone hosted both men at a party in 1997, and he's told a very different story. Van Damme, Stallone claimed, had tired of Seagal's disses and challenged him to a fight in Stallone's backyard. As Stallone recounted for FHM, Seagal made his excuses and left. But Van Damme, who was berserk, tracked him down at a nightclub and offered him out again. Again, Seagal pulled a Houdini. Van Damme was just too strong. Seagal wanted none of it. 
George Foreman followed up a storied boxing career by becoming a TV commercial pitchman, successfully selling enough of his namesake grills to rack up a nine-figure fortune. Despite all that wealth, the former two-time heavyweight champ was willing to step back in the ring in order to fight Steven Seagal in 2017. At age 68, he was no spring chicken, yet he felt that he still had the skills to take on Seagal when he issued this challenge via Twitter. Steven Seagal, I challenge you one-on-one. -on -one. I use boxing, you can use whatever. Ten rounds in Vegas. A few days after his tweet, Foreman told Everlast that he was in the midst of discussions with Seagal's manager and would be talking further in the coming days. He hadn't spoken with Seagal directly because the actor was in Russia at the time. Such a face-off would have been legendary, but alas, it never actually happened. At the time, though, Foreman was quite confident. As he told Everlast, I say ten-round event, but I don't think it'll go ten rounds. The guy can kick, so I gotta get some defense for kicking, but I think I can knock him out in one or two rounds. Steven Tobolowsky is a well-known character actor, perhaps most famous as Ned Ryerson, the persistent insurance salesman in Groundhog Day. His credits also include a co-starring gig with Steven Seagal in 1996's The Glimmer Man, an experience he recalled during a 2011 interview with the AV Club. He was playing a serial killer, so he jokingly summarized his time on the movie with three words – trauma, terror, and confusion. When he arrived on set for the first day of shooting, he was told that Seagal wanted to rewrite the script. As Tobolowsky described it, he decided it was bad for his karma to constantly be killing people in movies, so he didn't want to kill me anymore. When it came time to shoot the scene, Seagal once again made it known that he wouldn't be killing the killer. Luckily, Tobolowsky had an idea, as he recounted. I said, Steven, that is an amazing argument. I never really thought of that before, but coming from my character's perspective, I am trapped in hell, being a serial killer. It is the worst thing that I could imagine. He continued, So if you were to kill me, you would actually be freeing me to come back in a reincarnational form as something better, and I would be able to atone for my sins here on Earth. So I think you would be doing me a huge favor." And Steven said, "...I never thought of it that way." Tobolowsky's character was eventually killed as scripted, though a Seagal ad-lib in another scene hinted otherwise. This forced Tobolowsky to come back in months later to fix the issue by adding an off-camera line for Seagal's character to finish him. As he bemoaned, "...it's ludicrous, and I don't know what they ended up showing." Liam Neeson is no slouch when it comes to kicking ass in action movies, so it's not too surprising that he has some thoughts about Steven Seagal. During a 2017 appearance on Jimmy Kimmel Live, he shared an unpleasant yet hilarious anecdote involving Seagal. Is it your dream to work with Steven Seagal? Is, yeah. that, <laughs> is that on your I want, bucket I want list? I know he dyed his hair. <laughs> Stevie Wonder. As it turned out, Neeson found himself annoyed with Seagal after a journalist asked him what he thought about the fact that Seagal had said that Neeson doesn't know how to punch. Neeson, who was a boxer in his youth, insisted that he, in fact, did know how to punch. Kimmel and Neeson then proceeded to discuss Seagal's visit to Russia, which led the host to quip, "...I don't know if he moved there or we sent him there and told him not to come back." 